Grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, the one who sows good words and good, good people into the world to make a difference and salts us with his word as well. Amen. Our focus for this morning is another salty word, but you know that a little pinch of salt is a good thing, but a whole lot isn't very good. Now imagine this for a second. You remember those, those, the way that sugar used to be delivered to people for those who were coffee drinkers in little cubes? It was just the right amount of sugar, and maybe if you were a kid, you could, you could um, snitch one of those, those sugar cubes out of the sugar bowl, and you crunch down on there's a burst of sugar. You ever done that? Any guilty here of doing that? Okay, maybe I was the only one. But here's the thing. Imagine if a sugar cube, some terrible joke was played upon you, maybe like someone who was want to go and snitch one, and it was not a sugar cube, but it was a salt cube. What would happen if you bit down on that? I can see from the looks on your faces, you wouldn't enjoy it too much. It'd be a burst of flavor. It would almost burn out your, your, your taste buds. And that's not what we want. So all that's by way of getting at the, the suggestion that someone made, since I took suggestions from the congregations of salty words, and kind of narrowing it down. The suggestion was eschatology and prophecy. Now, eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos, which is last, and eschatology is concerned with the last things, or the end of the world, if you want to go that direction. Um, and prophecy also is a big, humongous thing. It's a huge salt cube that if we were to try to consume it all in one bit, this is a, a whole year Bible study or a whole seminary level course that would just consume so much time. So how do we narrow this down? Well, I found a word that I think encapsulates what this person was going for when they made the suggestion, and it's one that I think is a really salty word, not just in the church, but in the world as well. So today we're going to examine the world, the, the word apocalypse. And if that doesn't make you a little bit nervous, there's a lot there. I think we need the, the Spirit of God to help us interpret this, and we'll get to that in a moment. Can we please pray, please pray for His presence with us as we hear His Word? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Rock and our Redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present that we may hear a good word from you. Amen. So if you hear the word apocalypse, people in our culture will automatically perk up and they, I think, automatically assume that it is a conversation about the end of the world. What is, what is the apocalypse? And how does it come about? That's probably the thing that most people will, will focus on, sometimes fixate on. And you may not know this, but there's actually a book in the Bible that is properly titled The Apocalypse. Did you know this? The actual, you go to the, go to the very end of the Bible, and we know that last book as what? Revelation. But if you look at the, the original Greek, the word that we come upon is apocalypsis, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ according to St. John. And we see, um, this is what the text says, the revelation, there we go, there's the word, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants, gave Jesus to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, and off we go. So, did you notice that this word apocalypse is connected to revelation? Do you see that? Now, again, if you ask people in our culture what the apocalypse looks like, there's probably a few things that they say might bring that about. And whether we're talking about science fiction writers or people who are trying to, to manage our world and make sure that it doesn't just end all of a sudden, there's a couple different ways that people will think of this may happen. And there are a few that I could just think of off the top of my head. So maybe a global pandemic. We know a little bit about that, don't we? But of course, those who are a little bit more fanciful will say, well, there's this virus that runs rampant through, through humankind and uh, kills off a whole bunch of people and they come back as what? Zombies. So we have a zombie apocalypse. It's, it's a good science fiction type of, of plot line. You get some great narratives out of it. Will that actually happen? I mean, it's kind of scary, so I hope not. But could that be a way that the world ends? I suppose anything is possible. Or maybe we look at the more common threat, the more real threat of thermonuclear war. 
we know that there are enough nuclear warheads on the planet to blow it up several times over. And so while we know that that, um, that is possible, we thank God every day that the people who ha handle the nuclear codes are not raving lunatics who have a death wish for the entire world. And that's God's work too, to keep their uh, people's fingers off buttons that they shouldn't be touching. Or maybe this last one is a little bit more present, a little bit more, uh, more on the nose for where our culture is right now. Artificial intelligence has become a big conversation for anybody who's looking at the tech world. And again, you follow that, that logic of what you put into AI and what it spits out. Well, what if AI started to believe that we as human beings are the problem with this planet and that we need to be eradicated? Well, I think you can queue up some um, Terminator type themes in there as well, and that's one way that the world could end, I suppose. But all that to say, whether it happens by thermonuclear war, or AI, or zombie apocalypse, or any other way, this is something that people think about and talk about in our culture, wouldn't you think? People are, are concerned about the end of the world, and I suppose there's good reason to do that. But what is the actual apocalypse? Let's go back to the text here for a second. The revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that word apocalypse actually mean? It, it's much more, instead of a, a revealing um, in any other way, it's, it's almost like an unveiling. So imagine, if you will, going to a magic show. And one of the most common magic tropes is that the magician will put a veil over something and kind of dangle it, and at the, a proper moment, they will pull it back, and what do they say? Ta-da! And it's really dramatic. Now, sometimes God works that way, and he pulls the, the veil off completely, and you see things for exactly as they are. Someday he's promised to do that when all things are put right. But for the time being, he shows us a little glimpse. He'll pull back a little bit of the veil and say, this is what it looks like. Or maybe think about, you remember some of those like little puppet shows where you have puppet animals that people make with their hands, or, or you can see shadows of, of whole people in the, through a, a sheet or something like that, but you can't see the, the detail, you just see the shadows? I think that's sometimes another way of talking about how God reveals things to us. He doesn't show us everything all at once, he shows us little bits and pieces to remind us that he's there for us, that he's promised things and he's going to fulfill them, but he doesn't show us the whole thing. But he's promised us someday there's going to be a revealing. And so when we talk about the apocalypse, it really has to do with God revealing what he has in store. And if we trust God to be the good God that he is, then that revealing is not filled with terror or loathing. It's filled with joy because all things are put right. So uh, how do we handle the apocalypse? That's another really good thing to have to think about. And I think we put it all back in God's hands. Does God reveal things to us? Yes, if you want to find the one point where he really reveals himself, shows up in person, it's in Jesus. It's on the cross. It's the empty tomb. That whole story reveals the heart of God. But God never reveals more than he wants to or before he wants to. And it's his will that has the final say. So that's where we kind of have to hang all of this. And when it comes to what the Bible says about the apocalypse, the end of the world, if you want to put it that way, then there are many different ways that we can get at this. And there are a few really important portions of the Bible that talk about the apocalypse, the end of the world, the final unveiling. And there are a couple things that are going to be helpful here. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing during our regular sermon series, Walking Through the Bible, is kind of one at a time handing off some what I would call hermeneutical tools. Now, yes, hermeneutical, it's a big word. Hermeneutic from interpret, that's another Greek word. Interpretational tools, because here's the thing. We don't exist as God's people on our own. We're made to live in community, and we live in an interpretive community. That's another name for the church. We need one another to stabilize one another, and God has given us tools to be able to look at God's word and figure it out. And some of it is pretty straightforward. Some of it is really, really convoluted. And we need one another to stabilize one another so we don't get off base. So over the, the past several months, and we're going to get back to this after the summer, I've been handing some of these hermeneutical tools off to you and, and bringing them back up. So whether it's these five movements in God's story, and we see how what we're talking about presently fits into that. The apocalypse kind of fits into that 
um, fifth category here, the regal return and restoration. Whether we're talking about how Christ is both the victim on the cross who bears our sin and banishes our sin and brokenness, or he is the, the victor who is, reigns over all things, has all authority, is the one who takes care of it all. Those are two motifs that we see. Whether it's the way that God's word is interconnected and self-referential in a way that hangs together very well, or we're talking about how the, the New and the Old Testament interplay. I've always been drawn to this, this uh, quote by Augustine of Hippo. Uh, the New Testament is hidden in the Old. Talk about that veiling, right? It's veiled, but it's there. And the Old Testament is made clear in the New. When you see all the motifs from the Old Testament come kind of crashing in through the veil in Jesus, and he's there in person. Now, this one last little hermeneutical tool I think is going to be really helpful, especially when it comes to apocalyptic literature, things that, about the end times, which can often trip, trip us up. This hermeneutical, hermeneutical tool, this interpretational tool, that we start, start with things that are more clear, and we move towards things that are less um, clear. So most people will say, if you want to know about the end of the world, where do you go in the Bible? You go to the last book, you go to Revelation, the final unveiling, and it's going to be super clear. It's not. It's, it's very convoluted. It's very symbolic. Um, and other, likewise, people will go to the book of Daniel and say, verses 9 through 12, there's some really interesting stuff about the end of the world in there. But I'll tell you this on, on good authority. There are Bible scholars who still puzzle over Daniel and say, I'm not exactly sure how to interpret this. So where do we start? We start at the center. We start with Jesus because Jesus actually does have a lot to say about what the end of the world looks like. We take it from his mouth first and then use that as a lens to illuminate everything else from Revelation to Daniel. Now, a, a word of, of caution before we kind of dig into a little bit of Matthew 24 and 25, which is where you'll find this. And I'd encourage you to read all through that this week. Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus' discourse. Here's the, 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 the little bit of warning. I've noticed, and maybe you have as well, some people will take one of two approaches to apocalyptic literature and the end of the world and how we approach that. Either it's on one extreme, oh, there's nothing to see here. We're just going to ignore it. We don't have to pay attention to that. That's just going to take care of itself. Or some people I've seen just go fall headlong into this idea of how the world is going to end and searching through the scriptures for any little bit and piece of, of knowledge about that so they can have a leg up and have an idea. And it gets a, a little bit fanatical sometimes. So here's the, the cautionary tale. On one side, we can't ignore what God says. We just can't do that. If God says it, it's important. So we can't dismiss it out of hand. At the same time, I have some people, I've known some people personally, who have dug so much into this apocalypse stuff, thinking about the future, that they forget to live in the present. And what this actually does is it robs us of the story of Jesus. It actually steals the gospel from us. Now, as the resident Bible nerd around here, I love to nerd out on the Bible. It's great. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. But if that's where my head and heart always is in the future and trying to figure my next step out, I might be forgetting that God has placed something beautiful right in front of me. He's placed the, the cross where Jesus died for me and you, the, the empty tomb that seals our resurrection and the communion and the, the community of God's people. I'm going to miss that if I'm so far into all the minutiae of apocalyptic literature. So we can't ignore it but we also don't want to let it steal our joy because there's a lot of scary stuff in there. And it's easy to, to just get fixated on that and be like, ah, oh, the world is going to heck in a handbasket instead of saying, we have hope as God's people that God's going to put it all right. So there's the kind of um, caution before we dig in. But uh, I really want to focus a little bit in on Matthew 24 just to get you started. And like I said, please read the rest of this throughout the week. So Jesus has just come with his disciples from Jerusalem. And let me set the scene for you a little bit. Um, Jesus and his disciples, most of them are, let's say, country bumpkins, right? They haven't seen the big city. And so Jesus takes them to Jerusalem. And what do they do? You ever taken someone who hasn't been to Chicago or other big city downtown? What do they do? Whoa, whoa, look, big, big buildings all over the place. Do you see this? This place is great. It's huge. I'm really impressed. 
And Jesus has a similar reaction with his disciples. His disciples are like, look at all these big buildings. I've never seen something so big. I'm really impressed. And Jesus says, you know, one day there's not going to be one stone left on another. It's all going to be rubble. And this actually is a bit of prediction, a bit of prophecy that comes true. AD 70, the Romans make sure that that happens. They raise it to the ground. But until that time, Jesus takes his disciples up on, on the Mount of Olives across the river to look out over Jerusalem, and his disciples come to him privately, just the, the 12 of them, and they say, tell us, when will these things happen? That's a pretty good question, right? People nowadays will ask, when's the end of the world going to be? It's kind of what they're saying. And what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Let us know what the indications will be so that we'll be well prepared, that we'll have our heads on straight. And Jesus replies to them, now, now, let me just really focus you in here. This is the concern that Jesus puts before his disciples many times in this section, and it's good for us to note that this is where he starts. Watch out that no one deceives you. It's so easy to become sidetracked by all sorts of, some really deceptive things, some really good things. Watch out that no one deceives you, sidetracks you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, I am Jesus, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. You heard any of any wars or rumors of wars recently? Is that happening right now? It is, but then again, that's been happening for thousands of years too. See that you are not alarmed. Do you hear the good news coming right out? Because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. You've heard of these things too. This is happening in our present time. Has been happening for thousands of years. So again, Jesus predicts it, but it's nothing new to us and it's still happening. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. The beginning of labor pains. What do labor pains tell a woman who's in labor? When the baby's coming. Those are indications we can notice, and these are the beginnings. But it's going to get worse. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you as God's people. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Doesn't sound like a fairy tale, right? It sounds more like a nightmare. Then many will fall away. I wonder why. Betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. There's that, that concern again. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. My friends, this is something that Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago, and it is just as relevant now as when he first spoke it then. There are people whose hearts have grown, grown cold because they look around at our culture and say, do you see how bad this place is getting? Do you see what's out there? Do, I know my own heart. I know it's not the best. The love of many will grow cold. Now, this is all seeming a lot of doom and gloom stuff, and Jesus is just shooting straight with his disciples and with you and me. But he doesn't land there. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's good news. The one who endures to the end, when all is said and done, the one who stays with Jesus, stays connected to him through all of it, all the trials, will be saved. Not maybe, will this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we've got Jesus' promises to hold on to here in the midst of a lot of things that are hard to understand. We have God's promise that he won't leave us, that even though many may fall away, that his love remains to all of us, those of us who endure and those who have started to fall away. There's always a place to come back. And so what, is, what does God want us to hear in the midst of all of this? I think that verse, verse 13, is where I want us to land today. Endure. Hold on. Hold on to the promises of God. And even when you feel like you're holding on by your fingernails, know that the one who made you, who died for you, who lives in you, is going to hold on to you so much more firmly than you can hang on to him. That's good news. And then, what does Jesus tell us? Well, to me, it sounds kind of like this. The end? <laughs> you ever get to the end of a really good book and you go, the end? I don't want it to be the end. 
And walking with God through a, a life like ours, there can be some difficult things, but there's a lot of beauty as well. We don't want it to end. We ins have an instinctual gravitation towards life. The end, I don't want it to be the end. It's not. Not forever. In the, in the hands of Jesus, that's the way our story ends. It's a, an ending that isn't a final ending. That's the thing that we hold on to. And I'm not sure if you heard this. There's certainly some of this kind of end-of-the-world stuff in our readings for today, but in case you, you missed it, I want to go back to the book of Isaiah here for one more time because I think this really puts a cherry on the top of this whole conversation to say that God is serious about us right now and when the end comes. This is what he says. This is what the Lord, the King of Israel and its Redeemer, the Lord of armies, the God who fights for us says, I am the first and I'm at the last. I'll be with you at the beginning. I'll be with you at the end. There is no God but me. Who like me can announce the future? Talk about future stuff, apocalypse, there it is. Let him say so and make a case before me since I have established an ancient people. Let these gods declare the coming things and what will take place. They don't know, only I know, he's saying. Do not be startled or afraid. There's some good news to hang on to with both hands. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God but me? There is no other rock. I do not know any. Stand on the rock. Endure to the end. Know that Jesus is holding you right now and into the future and forever. Good news? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you that you, you fill us with good things. And even in the moments where we see how scary this world can be, you remind us that you are still the one who's in charge. That we see just a little bit through the veil, just a little peek from time to time that you grant to us, but we don't see the whole picture. And so while some of that may seem very dark and very scary, we trust you to walk us through that. We pray that we would endure to the end and find your care and your concern follows us all of our lives and past that. Teach us to trust in the resurrection of Jesus as a real thing that's not just real for him, but it's real for us as well. We ask it in your name, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts, your minds always in Christ Jesus who does endure with us to the end. Amen.